full-time ministry, which is wonderful. One works with the Native American youth in northern Wyoming. Uh, one is a worship pastor in Calgary, Alberta. And then my son-in-law is actually facilities manager for a church in Smith Mountain Lake, Virginia, where we live. One thing unique about our family that I think you'll appreciate, I married a pastor's daughter. My oldest son married a pastor's daughter. My second son married a pastor's daughter. And my son-in-law married a... You figured that out, didn't you? Yeah, how about that? So I always say we got a little bit of ecclesiastical inbreeding going on. It's kind of like a religious West Virginia, but uh, our little grandkids are normal so far, and we're grateful for that. So uh, anyway, a little bit about our team. I want to talk to you about leading a culture of prayer, and I've been instructed to kind of reduce the teaching down so we have a little bit for Q&A and a little bit to actually pray. How about that? So I know you've been integrating that into the other sessions already, but we're going to do it again in kind of a unique way that I think will be a blessing to you. Um, just right up front, I want you to know I'm not a natural prayer guy. Uh, some of you thought this guy's, I always joke, you're going to walk in swinging incense, wearing a robe, glowing in the dark, dripping Shekinah juice everywhere, you know, prayer guy. That's not me. I'm fiercely independent by nature. And I would just tell you right now, if, if I can discover and experience anything that's life-changing in prayer, you are in great shape. Uh, because it's all been the grace of God in me. It all started with conviction, which we'll talk about. Uh, and you probably already picked up on this from Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. I actually lead a global fellowship of pastors called the 6-4 Fellowship. And Vance is, has been a vital part of that. And uh, it really is calling pastors back to prayer and the ministry. The Word is the, the uh, ultimate priorities of ministry. We'll talk more about that here in just a moment. So as we get started, I want to uh, just uh, mention to you this title, Transforming. You don't normally think of transforming as it relates to prayer. Uh, <laughs> so many times we think that prayer is simply therapeutic, but it's really transformational. And uh, in my own journey, uh, I had the joy of pastoring three primary churches, two of which were in a heap of trouble uh, on the heels of very high visibility moral failure. I was a cleanup guy. They call me the OSHA pastor. Uh, so we get that. Uh, and one was following a 40-year godly predecessor, very traditional. Uh, but in all three of those cases, God brought amazing transformation, healing, uh, re-engagement and mission uh, because of a culture of prayer. And a culture is more than prayer activity, more than a prayer program. It, it really is changing the very DNA of the church so that we are not just, as we say, a church that prays, but really a praying church. And uh, my experience with prayer, I often talk about this, I won't go into depth, but it has not always been positive. Uh, I talk about the fact that as a kid I had a drug problem. It wasn't fentanyl, but my parents drugged me to the old-fashioned Wednesday night prayer meeting every week of my life. And if you've ever been in one of those, you know what that is like. Um, and it was a long list of 45 minutes of prayer requests. I thought everybody in the country has an ingrown toenail, a slipped disc, a cousin with a broken down car, a friend in financial crisis. I'm so depressed at that point, I don't even feel like praying, right? And then we gather together in what I call the bless be with syndrome, bless her, be with him, bless her, be with him. And uh, no wonder it's the, uh, the least attended gathering of the week, right? Because that's not really what prayer is supposed to be, ultimately. And we're going to talk about that. And uh, just in my own journey, had the joy uh, for most of those years of leading about seven or eight prayer meetings a week, not meetings with prayer, but meetings to pray. Not because I'm a big prayer guy, but because that's the way I was going to learn to pray. And that's the only way you teach your people to pray, by the way. You have to actually pray. What a thought. And um, we eventually had uh, about 12 other prayer meetings a week. Um, I've had the joy of leading probably 50 prayer summits in the context of my own pastoral a journey and now every year multiple days away with no agenda which doesn't sound very baptist but it is biblical and uh, just have seen god transform people's lives so i want to share with you out of my own journey i have a phd in prayer in the school of hard knocks that's basically it and uh, I, I want this to be an encouragement to you so i'm going to just share a few thoughts about that but before we do i want to mention a couple things i think we have a slide about our prayer immersion let me tell you about this uh, in August, we are going to the Brooklyn Tabernacle, if you ever heard of that. We are vetting very carefully a young group, a group of young leaders. We are age discriminating under 30. So sorry, old guys, all right? Under 30 church planters or seminarians who are going to be lead pastors. 
We actually have a donor who's paying for the flights, the meals, the housing, and the experience of going to the prayer meeting, being trained by Pastor Simbola and our team, because we want you to get that experience early on. So I need you to take your phones out. Just humor me, all right? Just humor me. Act like you're doing this. Uh, take a picture of that QR code, because it may not be you. You may know of a young seminarian who uh, really needs a fresh understanding of prayer and experience. There's an old Brazilian proverb that says, the heart cannot taste what the eyes have not seen. And uh, we have some amazing testimonies as we did this last year. And so, again, be aware of that because we would love to include uh, maybe some young church planters that you know or some seminarians who have promise as future lead pastors. While you have your phone out, let me give you one more QR code. I should just get these on my bald spot and I can just walk around and have you take pictures. <laughs> but, uh, the Six Four Fellowship. Uh, this is a, a, a free resource for pastors and church leaders that really allows you to get a new resource every week to pray with other like-minded pastors in your region, uh, to be aware of events and things that are going to keep fueling your fire. And, of course, that's based on Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. Again, Vance has been part of our national leadership team. Others you might know, Bill Elliff, H.B. Uh, Charles, Jim Semela, et cetera. So it really is a coalition of pastors who are saying we want to make the next new thing the first old thing and really get back to the things that matter most. By the way, there's also a code on the back if, if that's easier for you on that screen. All right, so we'll say more about that here in a moment. But um, as we um, invite pastors into the 6-4 Fellowship, I got one more diagram just to share with you very briefly about what we do. And it starts with conviction, a conviction about the priority of prayer and the word. And then we inspire you through community as you connect with other pastors. And then we want to help grow your capacity to lead a culture of prayer. And in the middle of that is coaching. They all start with C because I went to seminary, all right? But uh, actually, Vance was very uh, instrumental in the conversation that shaped this. And I wanted to show you that if you go to the 6-4 website, you would see that kind of a, a cyclical progression there. Uh, but I want to really anchor our conversation today around those same thoughts, conviction, community, capacity, and coaching. All right? So let's jump into that. And I want to talk to you about uh, really leading a culture of prayer in your church with the foundation of conviction to embrace the priority and practices of Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. Uh, you probably heard this in various um, uh, nuances in the past, the way I always say it is that the power of no is in a stronger yes. The power of no is in a stronger yes. One of my elders used to say, Daniel, uh, no is a Christian word, right? No is a Christian word. In fact, I love this little exercise. Turn to someone next to you, look at them in the eye, and just tell them no as forcefully as you can, all right? Tell somebody <laughs> next to you no. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's great. That's the most therapeutic thing you've done in weeks right there, all right? But here's the deal. It's hard to say no if you don't know what your yeses are. And I want to say to you that your yeses, I believe with all of my heart, I would not be in ministry today had I not discovered this early on. Your yeses have to be rooted in the text. And I don't know a better text. You heard it already last night than really Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. Prayer, the word, and then as you know from that chapter, uh, empowering others to take on ministry as they did with the seven who were selected to uh, kind of oversee the widow feeding program that broke down, right? I do want to point out to you that in the Old Testament, there's another kind of leadership crisis where a leader had to make some hard choices because he couldn't do it all. Anybody remember who that was? Moses, right? Exodus 18. If I asked you, what did Jethro tell him to do? Most of you would say, delegate to other judges, right? But if you look at the text, that was the third thing he told him to do. He actually said, Moses, now that I have your attention, listen to me and the Lord will be with you, which is a big statement. Number one, represent the people before God. Number two, teach them the statutes of the Lord. And number three, appoint judges. The reason I point that out is because in both the Old and New Testament, a similar leadership crisis comes back to the same three priorities in the same order. Prayer, the word, empowering others to lead. Prayer, the word, empowering others to lead. So I would say to you that if you're going to develop a prayer culture, you need to have a conviction about what your own priorities are. 
and how you are actually going to live those out in the reality of your schedule. A prayer culture always emanates from the epicenter of leadership. You can have prayer activity, you can get a prayer committee, you can appoint Uncle Joe to take over the prayer team because he has no other talent and he just retired. But you will not have a prayer culture unless it starts here. And then it starts within your leadership team, eventually your staff, your elders, because it always emanates from the epicenter of leadership. You can't point the way, you have to lead the way. And so you have to engage your team in some patterns of prayer as well so that they also embrace these priorities. I was just having my own journey. Uh, I took over three churches that had elders who weren't elders. Uh, they were trustees. And they want to sit and talk about budgets and buildings and programs and broken toilets and all that stuff. And we had to go through the hard journey of transitioning them from fiddling around with that stuff that could easily be given to other smart people and to become leaders who are committed to prayer and the ministry of the word in the function of the team. And by the way, Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 is not a reference to their personal time of prayer in the word. If you study the text, it's a reference to what the leaders did together. We will devote ourselves continually to the prayers and the ministry of the word. That becomes a trans transformational force in the life of the church as God begins to then, from that epicenter, to build a culture of prayer. Uh, I, I, for years, were trying to really make that change from trustee to elder. And so we read a bunch of books together, right? Uh, one was Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Cimbala. Then he wrote a book called Fresh Faith. We read that. He wrote one called Fresh Power. We read that. And he read a book on fresh produce. We probably read that too, all right? Uh, we read a book on eldership. But I would suggest to you, as you are starting your church, make sure you embed clearly in your own heart and in your leadership team the power of yes that allows you to say no to lesser things and that then enables you to, to uh, really equip other people to take on those other dimensions of ministry so that you can stay focused. All right, number two, the focus on community that will inst inspire and invigorate perseverance. I would just suggest to you that um, today we suffer from what is called rugged individualism in our culture. Gene Getz talked about that. We think in terms of I, me, and my rather than we, our, and us. And if you're going to lead a culture of prayer, you have to have a clear conviction about the corporate nature of prayer biblically. Um, when people ask me, which is more important, private prayer or corporate prayer, my answer is yes. It's like asking which leg do you need to walk on more, your right leg or your left leg? But in Western culture, we have amputated our corporate prayer leg, and we are lame on our private prayer leg, and the devil loves it so. And so if you're going to lead a culture of prayer, first of all, it has to start with the leadership. Secondly, it has to be embedded in a strong conviction about community and praying together very specifically. I would just say to you that um, we, again, think so individualistically, and we actually tend to take the New Testament teachings on prayer and retranslate them into individual application which was neither the original language nor the original delivery system. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but before the advent of the printing press, the only way to receive truth was together, right? And they would instinctively apply that truth to their own lives in community. Al Mohler makes the great statement. He says, there is no I in the Lord's Prayer. Hmm. You ever thought about that? All the pronouns are plural. I had an elder one day say to me, Daniel, I'm not coming to those prayer meetings. I said, why not, Bob? He said, well, two reasons. Number one, the Bible says don't pray to be seen by men. And if I showed up, I'd just be doing it, you know, to, to be viewed as a good elder. And he said, secondly, the Bible says pray in your closet, so I'm going to stay home and pray by myself. I said, well, would you like some feedback, Bob? He said, sure. I said, well, number one, change your motive and come. You can do that, right? There are a lot of other motives that are right that would compel you to pray. I said, secondly, we need to renovate your closet because that sucker's way too small, right? And we will get into this. We have a whole session in our coaching about it. Uh, but the, the Greek word tamion, translated closet, and the only version that uses that word, by the way, is the old King James 1611, otherwise just a room, obviously was a reference to what they did in the upper room, right? 
Because that's where they were gathered together, praying together, experiencing that, not parading their prayers to be seen by men, but gathering collectively in community to pray. I've often said it, and maybe you have too, that, well, the corporate prayer level of our church will never be any stronger than the private prayer lives of our people. Mm. That sounds really good, doesn't it? And it's truth to that. But what if the opposite is also true? What if the opposite is more true? That the private prayer lives of our people will never be any stronger than the corporate prayer life of our church. Mm -hmm. D.A. Carson says the only way people learn to pray is by praying. And so I would suggest to you that it's both and. We need to encourage and help our people develop a robust personal prayer life. But it is intricately related to our own modeling of prayer and the experiences of prayer that they are able to enjoy in the context of the church. I want you to also understand that not only do we need to do that, but within the context of community, we need to build sidewalks on the footpaths. And you may have heard that already from somebody else who steals my material. I won't mention his name, but uh, we need to build sidewalks where the footpaths already exist. You say, what do you mean, Daniel? Well, instead of creating more prayer activity, why don't we then begin to see the environments where our people are already meeting anyway and begin to change the way they are praying together in those contexts? Does that make sense? In Texas, apparently, this came from Texas, they used to build universities and they put sidewalks in, but the students never used the sidewalks, right? So they got brilliant and they decided, well, next building, we're not going to put any sidewalks in. We're going to see where the footpaths are. And we'll put sidewalks where the footpaths already exist. As you build your ministry, there are already environments where people are getting together. There's one-on-one -on -one conversations. There's small groups. There's ministry team meetings. And as you know so well, you've heard from Vance, there is the gathering of the church where we need to begin to build prayer experiences in those environments where they are already meeting. And that's how you really begin to change the culture, uh, not just calling a separate prayer meeting, but teaching people to really experience biblical prayer in the context in which they are already finding community. So I want you to embrace the corporate nature of prayer and begin to realize in those contexts of relationship, you can begin to build prayer culture uh, without creating extra events and activities. All right. Number three, the formation of capacity to strengthen competence and confidence. So we've already used those words, conviction, and the community, now capacity. What do I mean by that? Well, to grow your capacity in leading prayer, you need to learn to uh, really embrace the original model for prayer. Maybe they've already taught about that here, the original prayer plan, we call it. Um, again, most of us have initiated prayer with some common traditional ideas. Like we get together, and the first thing we ask, does anybody have any prayer requests, right? And that thing goes in the ditch fast and you never get out of it, right? And then you rarely have time to pray. Or we'll just tell people, hey, let's pray as we feel led. And what they hear is just start praying whatever comes to your mind. And that's usually disconnected mishmash of all kinds of thoughts, right? One guy's praying against Trump. One guy's praying for Trump. You know, I mean, it gets crazy. Uh, or we say pray around the circle. You've done that, right? And the bad part about that is if you're the last person in the circle, everybody stole your material, right? Uh, so the way we ought to pray and lead prayer meetings is very simple. Let's open our Bibles. Let's let God start the conversation. Because whoever starts a conversation tends to guide it. But specifically, as we pray from the Word of God, we need to pray according to what Jesus told us to do. And I want to unpack that very quickly. You know in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, there is we call the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, the disciples' prayer. What you may not have thought about recently is that when Jesus said, pray this way, it's a present imperative in the Greek. Now, that's heavy because that's not an option now. He literally is commanding his followers that they must always pray like this. How many of you think it's okay to just obey a clear command once in a while? Anybody? Don't raise your hand, by the way. Yeah. You're supposed to obey a command clear command all the time. And Jesus literally commanded his disciples, you must pray this way. So I know you may appreciate all kinds of other weird ideas about prayer, but we need to get back 
to the idea of praying the way Jesus commanded us to in a clear way. I want to show you a couple of graphics to explain that. One of which is what we call, uh, we call it the 2 2 pattern. If you're musical, uh, you know what we call split times, so up and down. It's pretty simple, right? Well, I learned um, from one of my mentors, John MacArthur, who I know you either pucker or duck when you say his name, right? But uh, he, he taught me that the Lord's Prayer has two halves fundamentally. The first half is all God word our Father, thy, 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 right? Second half is all man word us, us, us. So the way we have captured that in our ministry, and this is sticky, he is worthy, we are needy. Say that with me. He is worthy, we are needy. The bottom line of that is we often say, and this will be on my tombstone, it's so much part of my DNA, but you have to seek his face before you seek his hand. You seek his face before you seek his hand. Because in so many of our churches, all we think about is seeking God's hand and not his face. And if all you ever do is seek his hand, you may miss his face. But if you seek his face, he'll be glad to open his hand in provision and power. So if nothing else, when you lead prayer, you must always start with the face before you get to the hand. And how do I do that? Well, out of the word of God. How else do you get the information, the inspiration you need to worship? You get it from the scriptures, right? Now, if you want to break that prayer down a little bit more, and I really should get this on my bald spot because I use it all the time. But I have a musical background, and I call it the 4-4 pattern. And we're going to experience this together here in just a moment. Uh, I, we always say that the prayer starts upward in reverence. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You worship first. Then it moves downward in response. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is my response to worship, saying, Lord, having worshipped you, now what I want to pray is your kingdom, your will, your plan. I want to align my heart with you in surrender, confession, yieldedness. You understand that? In fact, I often say, I don't even know what to pray about until I've worshiped well and surrendered completely. And now I'm actually praying in Jesus' name. It's not just three words I tack on. I'm really praying with the mindset and the heart of Jesus having done that. Well, then you move to request. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I often say I stutter on my R's at this point. Went to seminary, obviously, so R's are working for me right now. But there are two categories of need in the model prayer. Resource needs, it's not on the screen, but resource needs and relationship needs. Think about that. Daily bread, those are my resource needs. I need a job, I need strength, I'm going in for surgery, uh, whatever. But then there are relationship needs. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. My marriage, you know, my kids, the antagonist at church. Everything on every prayer list that you've ever seen is either a resource need or it's a relationship need. Jesus was so insightful about our struggles, wasn't he? Now, it'd be nice if you get in there, but now you got to get off your knees and get into battle, right? So we call this readiness. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from email. And so you're really facing, just seeing if you're still with us right after lunch, deliver us from evil. What's the point? Lord, now, don't let us get stuck in the temptations, trials, and evil of the day. Give us power to live in victory. So reverence, response, request, readiness. And then, of course, if you have the, the King James, the majority text, it winds up with, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, and forever. So in a sense, you open the door and close the door in worship. But it is, let me say this emphatically, guys, it is a matter of obedience for you to learn to pray like this, and for you to teach your people to pray like this. Now, you don't have to use R's. You might prefer T, S. You know, I, I don't care. This is just how we have framed it. It's like the musical pattern, right? Upward, downward, inward, outward. It's sticky. It helps people. And you begin then to look at the text through that lens in order to lead your people in prayer effectively. All right? So, again, in our coaching cohorts, we go through that in depth and uh, we help you learn to practice that and lead it effectively. Again, we've all been in prayer meetings where we're praying for the rapture because we're so crummy at leading them, right? Uh, but hopefully that can change as we follow the pattern that Jesus gave us. And then the other thing I want to just mention is to equip others for exponential uh, culture growth. The point being, if you're going to build sidewalks where the footpaths exist, one of the most important things you do as a pastor is you train others to do this as well. 
You train them to open their Bible, lead a scripture-fed, spirit-led, worship-based prayer meeting, and then you begin to see that it's getting into your small groups and your leadership teams and their families and their marriages. That's how you develop a culture of prayer. And you know the Lord's going to bless us because in obedience, you are now praying the way that he commanded us to pray. And it's not restrictive, it's life-changing. It's not a burden to do this. It becomes just such a blessing. And it becomes instinctive to learn to pray this way because Jesus told us to do it, and he's going to give us the power and grace to do it. Last thing I want to mention is just the fruit of coaching. And uh, I want to tell you that that is available to you. We call it prayingleader.com. Uh, we've had about 800 pastors go through it. I want you to see Tim Wheat's email over here. Tim, raise your hand. Most of you know Tim. Tim is kind of the gatekeeper. Uh, the SIN Network is partnering with us to help get many of you through this coaching. It's a 90-day experience. Some of you in this room are in it right now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, several of you. Yeah. So uh, you guys are skipping out today. I'll, I'm going to tell Henderson on you, all right? Uh, but uh, it's a wonderful experience over 90 days. We meet seven times and giving you the tools long-term in order to keep leading your church in a culture of prayer. So before we have some Q&A and jump into a prayer time, I know I've been going quickly. This usually takes me about an hour, so you got the uh, drink from the fire, fire hose version, all right? But I want to give you an opportunity to ask a couple questions, and then we're going to have a prayer time. But I want to show you a video. I always say satisfied customers are better than paid salesmen. Uh, so this is one of your uh, SEND uh, church planters that went through uh, coaching uh, last year. And his name is Kenji, and I think you'll enjoy just hearing his story. All right, so let's watch this together. Can you read lips? Yeah. So uh, maybe we won't watch Kenji. What do you think? All right, yeah, it's really good. I want you to pause and contemplate what he said so far. Look at the intensity on his face. Look at the Shekinah juice dripping from his ears. No, um, we're no good. All right, so we're skipping Kenji. But um, again, it's just a wonderful journey. We would love for you to be a part of that as you are able. So you've taken in a lot. I want to give you a couple minutes for questions, and then we're going to look at this pattern and actually pray. All right, any questions, comments, suggestions, or snide remarks about anything you've heard so far uh, today? Anybody at all? Bless you, yes, indeed. Do you have any uh, suggestion like how, how much time should we spend in prayer? How much time should you spend in prayer? Yeah, they, they well, like we have, uh, well, there's no criteria, you know. Yeah, it's not really a matter of time. It's a matter of focus and heart. Uh, but the reason I showed you both of those approaches to the model prayer is because if you don't have a lot of time, say you're praying 10 minutes before a service, you can at least do he's worthy where you're needy, right? Uh, we can at least start with the face and then move to the hand out of the text of Scripture. Uh, if you have more time, obviously, uh, all four of those movements can be beautiful. And I would just say this, when I lead prayer, we usually incorporate song sometimes between the two, between the segments rather, to capture the truth of what we just prayed collectively. Uh, it's kind of become popular today to have song fests with prayer. We call it a prayer night, but it's really singing. Uh, I am a fan of scripture-driven prayer with song, not song-driven prayer, you know, with scripture, if that makes any sense. So, yes, sir. I'm trying to figure out uh, my good friend Bill Ellen. Oh, Bill, yeah. Uh, he's telling me to meet with guys and pray, so we started meeting and praying. And, uh, but the idea of Moving them to do it themselves in groups. Uh, I mean, we're a local church, so sure. and I'm leading the pastoral work, and so we're together praying, and we pray every Thursday morning, really, mm -hmm. and um, and all that. But there's a kind of a there's like there's a group of men in our church family, and there's a group of men that pray with me, and I think I'm getting a ceiling of sorts. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking about how do I. What do I do next? Mm -hmm. Now my elders are like, "Hey, we're okay with just meeting and praying. Right. We're loving this, right? But I am feeling a weight of like, 
how do I equip those men to branch out? Almost like Bill Haas and Navigators. How do I, yeah. how do I move them to begin to do more than what Yeah, that's a great I question. Think Jethro would think. Yeah, that's yeah. why I'm starting to think about it. Yeah. It's been great. We've been together like 120 Thursday mornings. Sure, We've but you want to see it multiply in the church. Just, how do you... What are your thoughts? Well, I would just tell you, one of the things that we did, uh, the prayer summit experience really ignited the hearts of our people. And our biggest prayer summits were our men, believe it or not, that they would go away for two or three days, take time off work, do nothing but pray, sleeping in crummy beds and eating bad food, right? But uh, the experience that ignited them to want to continue and to grow. Uh, we have a resource, in fact, that's part of our coaching group too, but it's a DVD called How to Lead Life-Giving Prayer Experiences. And I would suggest as well, you may want to add some unique experience like a retreat for the men where you actually pray more than play basketball, right? You actually pray. Uh, but then I would start doing some training. I would tell you this, probably seven, eight times a year, I would teach anybody and everybody who would come how they can do what I was doing, how they could open the scripture. They could start with worship. They could sense the, the spirits prompting as far as how to pray. So I would probably find both experience and equipping dynamics that would accelerate that to the next you level. You with you as well? I'm sorry? Did you say you led seven prayer meetings and there were other prayer meetings? Yeah, I'm sorry. But I led seven, but there were the total was 12. There are about five others that I didn't lead each week. Yeah. I guess yeah. that's my question. How yeah. do you move to that? Well, it's, you know, it's got to be a priority. you got to take some things off your plate. And you got to realize I've got to spend more time praying with my people. And uh, obviously, it's a win-win for your own heart. But obviously, they begin to really catch the experience of what that's like. And then as you equip them, it can really go viral into the life of the church. So hopefully, that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. We'll take one more. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking uh, uh, when it comes to practicality. But, um, whether it's uh, starting a structure, like we hear a lot of people talk about prayer teams, prayer, uh, you know, people who's they have staff members who are over prayer, kind of... Uh, you know, so, so I think on one practical sense, building a culture of prayer, what that looks like in and through your people, um, right. you can feel free to cast as much vision as, obviously there's some of us who are really on the, on the laying the foundation are very much on the front end of right. that. Right. You can feel free to cast a little bit of a, a vision as far as longevity of what it looks like to kind of build that culture out yeah. through people. And then the second thing that I, was, that I was kind of thinking through is obviously there's a lot of people who have kind of gotten into prayer rooms and kind of some of those different dynamics. Um, any thoughts you have on maybe how this can actually flesh out yeah the for sure. yeah so again that that becomes the difference between culture and programming yes. and i think the tendency is to try to create some prayer structure and prayer activity before the culture is in place and the culture always has to start with you as the leader and the leaders around you so that it goes viral into you know rather than creating other silos of prayer you're actually allowing the leadership to take that passion into their own ministries and then it begins to take on a life of its own structurally if that makes any sense uh, it, again i would just say this kind of candidly pastors tend to create some of those structures in order to subcontract the responsibility and you can't do that you can obviously have people help you in the structure of the prayer but it has to it has to be led by the pastor you just, you can't, the, the prayer level of the church is never going to rise any higher than the personal example and passion of the senior leader and then his leadership team. And when they have that fire, they're going to take it into the children's ministry, youth ministry, et cetera, rather than creating a separate prayer ministry. Does that make sense? Because uh, that can often be a mistake because then people think, oh, well, I don't have to pray because the prayer ministry or the prayer warriors take care of that. No. We all have to become a people of prayer in the environments in which we're already functioning in the church. So, Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, one more, and then we'll pray. Seven prayer meetings that you led. Can you just describe the, what those were? Sure, yep. So uh, Sunday mornings, uh, 6.30, we met every Sunday, prayed through a different psalm, which is where we have a new resource called Praying the Psalms just came out of that. Uh, we would actually prayer walk the auditorium, gather at the end and pray. Uh, Monday mornings, I met with the men in our church uh, at 6 o'clock. So my wife's been a, Monday, a morning widow for many years. Um, our staff would meet and pray together two to three times a week for 45 minutes to an hour. So that was five. We had a church-wide prayer meeting uh, that happened every Thursday night. And we probably had 35% of our Sunday crowd that would come to that. And then um, we had prayer summits, of course, that added to that. 
uh, we, I had a thing called pastor's prayer partners and I would typically meet with them. And so there were six that were standard and there were others that would rotate in. And it was an average about seven, seven prayer meetings a week. Yeah. Again, not because I was spiritual. I just knew if this is a priority, I've got to put time into it. Otherwise, take it off my priority list and just admit that I've got other things that are more important than, than leading a praying church. Does that make sense? That's kind of the nitty gritty of it. Yeah. All right. Someone have a birthday in April? Anybody? That's going to sound very random. Right there. You have one in April? All right. Could you, as soon as it comes to your mind, give me any number between 0 and 15? doesn't matter. Plus. Which one? Plus. Four? Plus. Sorry. Plus. One. Okay. Any number between 0 and 9? Nine. Nine. All right. Psalm 19. That's an easy one. All right. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Today is my birthday. And today's your birthday. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday to you. No, no, we're in a hurry. God bless you. All right. All right. Psalm 19. <laughs> Uh, I do this just because I'm stupid, all right? But uh, this, this makes me nervous every time we do it. But to spontaneously look at a psalm and pray out of the text in the moment. And we've got about 15 minutes to do that, all right? Is that right, time-wise? At 25 after we're done, all right? So um, I know that this psalm is too long for us to cover in 15 minutes. But I want us to do this. Let's just take the part about the law of the Lord, verses 7 through 11, and we're going to look at it through the lens of the model prayer, okay? Hope that makes sense to you. I've got the ESV in the interest of time. I usually have someone else read it, and then we all jump in and give some insights. But we're going to look at it, and the first question we're going to ask is, what does this tell us about God and his character, right? Because we're going to start with reverence. And then we're going to look at it and say, well, how can I respond in alignment, confession? And then we're going to say, how can I trust the Lord out of this text with some needs? And how can I get battle ready? So verses 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testament of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired today than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is worn, in keeping them there is great reward. So uh, I've mentioned these morning prayer meetings where we read a psalm and say, what does this tell us about God and his character? Again, in the interest of time, let me just go through quickly. Everything the law of the Lord is, the Lord is, right? Everything his law is, is an expression of his character. So this is pretty easy. He's perfect. He's a reviver. He is sure. He's wise. Uh, he, is, he is right. He is a God of joy. Rejoices the heart. He is pure. He enlightens our eyes. He's clean. He is forever. He's eternal. Uh, he's true. He's righteous. He's more precious than gold. He's sweeter than honey. And uh, he's a God who warns us and rewards us. Wow. You think there's any material there you can worship God out of? So I said this in our initial coaching cohort the other day. I'm a hunter. And when I look at a text, we either do rifle or shotgun. Rifle is we just focus on one attribute. And we just praise God around that attribute. Shotgun means, in my little brain, we'll just look at all those attributes and worship him based upon whatever speaks to our heart. So here's what we're going to do right now. Around your table with that text in front of you, don't ask for anything. There are trap doors under your chair. If you go to the hand right now, you're out. All right? Stay on the face. And here's what I want you to do just the next two or three minutes. Lord, I worship you because you are, based on these truths about who God is. Keep it short, by the way. Otherwise, I'm going to come and tap you on the shoulder and say, buddy, did your train of thought have a caboose or not? All right? Don't steal everybody's opportunity. Just keep it short. I praise you, Lord, because you are, based on the truths we see in Psalm 19, 